Good evening and welcome to the third program in our series, Reckoning, U.S. Presidents and Racial Inequality. I am Robin von Seldeneck with the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library, and I will be the moderator for this evening. This series, which is possible thanks to funding from the National Endowment for Humanities, explores individual presidents' views and political policies toward minority populations. We believe that these types of discussions among historians that include questions from the public are opportunities for honest conversation and reflection. We are indebted to our fellow presidential sites, such as the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library, who partner with us on these programs. If you are new to the series, I encourage you to visit presidentsandrace.org to see video recordings of our Andrew Jackson and Abraham Lincoln sessions. This evening, we will begin with a conversation with our panelists, followed by questions from the audience. We want to hear from you, so please use the Q&A button on your screen to type in your question. At this time, I am pleased to introduce this evening's panelist. First is Dr. Ryan P. Sims, who's the professor and coordinator of the Congressional and Political Research Center at the Mississippi State University Libraries. He has been on the faculty at Mississippi State University since 2007 and has worked as archivist with Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library since 2009. Ryan is currently working on a book which focuses on the connections between foreign and domestic policy and the nature of citizenship during the Reconstruction era. David S. Nolan holds the rank of professor in the Mississippi State University Libraries. He is co-editor of the Personal Memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, the complete annotated edition, and a co-author of Hold On with a Bulldog Grip, a short study of Ulysses S. Grant. And also with us this evening is Eddie Rand Gale, the assistant to the executive director of the Grant Presidential Library and Museum. He also plays an active role in managing the Ulysses S. Grant Association. He is a PhD candidate in history at Mississippi State University, where his dissertation focuses on American Cold War diplomacy. He holds a BA in history from Blue Mountain College and an MA in history from Mississippi State University. Welcome. In preparation for this program, I asked acquaintances about what they knew of President Ulysses S. Grant. There were responses such as he was a drunkard, he was involved in several scandals, and a few others talked about his disheveled appearance. Others talked about the fact that he died nearly destitute. Few could really speak to the role that Grant played in our history during Reconstruction. And these comments led me to wonder if when it comes to Grant, maybe our education about him was affected by the lost cause narrative. So at this time, I would like to ask our panelists to share a little bit about who Grant really was. David, would you like to start? Would you like me? Well, well sure, I, I can jump in and uh, I was gonna kind of start by talking about uh, the myths that uh, Robin mentioned are myths that, uh, that we are very familiar with here at the Grant Presidential Library because uh, a lot of our visitors come in and, and we've sort of found this over the years that um, people come in with preconceived notions about Grant. Uh, sometimes the associations that they have with Grant are negative, like some of the, uh, the mythology uh, that you mentioned, uh, those specific examples. Uh, but other times the association that people have with Grant is just with him as a larger than life figure from the 19th century. Um, you know, if, if people have a positive association with him, sometimes it's the idea that he is sort of the unapproachable man on the equestrian statue on the pillar way above and, and he doesn't seem uh, to be very human. Um, and so I, this, this might be a good point to kind of transition to, to Eddie talking a little bit about sort of what we do at the Grant Presidential Library before we get into the nuts and bolts of, of Grant's life. But 
Uh, one thing that we try to do here is sort of allow people to encounter Grant the man, uh, Grant the human being who was a husband and father uh, living through extraordinary times. And so Eddie, I don't know if you wanna speak some to, to the presidential library and, and what we're doing here in Mississippi in the first place, that's probably the burning question that's on everyone's minds. And then we can talk a little more specifically about the, the details of Grant's life. Sure. Uh, well, I thought we may leave that question for the end to keep people on the hook, but let's get to it right away. It's all right. It works either way. But um, yeah, so the, the big question that we get a lot of times from our patrons is, well, why is the Grant Presidential Library in Mississippi? It, it makes no sense, you know, if, if we look back at his career and um, the, the Civil War. But in a way, it kind of does. And, and the way that I always explain it to people is if the Grant Presidential Library were in, in New York or um, Illinois or Ohio, the three states perhaps where Grant spent the most time, you would expect it to be there and you may not really give it that much thought. But for us, it's really beneficial that um, we have that hook, right? That question is, well, why is the Grant Presidential Library in Mississippi? And so people, people naturally just They'll call from you know California and say, "Well, I have to see this now, right?" And so they, they come and, and we have that hook, and so we have their attention, and so they're able to come in into our museum, where we address a lot of these myths that that Robin and, and David was just sort of topically getting at. But um, the the real answer to the question as to why Grant is in Mississippi is perhaps not as it's it's not as like you know shiny as you may think. There's no there's no big there's no big surprise there. Uh, all that to say is that the Grant Association was located for a really long time at Southern Illinois, Southern Illinois University under the direction of Dr. John Y. Simon, the first executive director of the, uh, of the Grant Association. Um, it was a close editing project at that point, so people couldn't really see the collection. Um, and it's not really until 2008, after the death of Dr. Simon, that the Grant Association begins shopping for a new home uh, for the, the collection. And so Mississippi State essentially emerges as um, the, higher, the highest bidder, if you will, where they promise the facility, the staff, the, the backing, and certainly the vision to turn a closed editing project into a presidential library, in large part due to the vision of our former executive director, Dr. John F. Marsalak, our former USDA president, Frank J. Williams, former Dean of Libraries, uh, Francis Coleman, and certainly our current MSU president, Dr. Mark E. Keenum, uh, who, who put together this vision to turn the, um, what we believe is a copy of every letter written to or uh, by Grant, and certainly a lot of material donated by the Grant family over the years, uh, to turn that into uh, what is now the U.S. Grant Presidential Library here on the campus of Mississippi State University. And, and I think what's in, important about that is, and it answers the question of who is Ulysses S. Grant, the, the editorial project, which began in 1962 um, and, and went for over 50 years and published 32 volumes of the written works of Ulysses S. Grant, I mean, it, part of that lost cause narrative is that people didn't think he was quite intelligent or quite loquacious. And, and even the people who loved him the most, they created a grand association, thought they would only really publish 10, 12 volumes, 15 volumes, because they just didn't think he had enough. He didn't have that much to say. Um, and of course, uh, the grand association, we published 32 volumes, not to mention David and, and his co-editors published you know, which you could call volume 33, the personal memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, which most literary um, scholars will tell you are one of the finest written uh, personal memoirs out there. Uh, the irony is, you know, people tend to call it a presidential memoir, but he really, uh, in that last chapter, I think, talks about the presidency for a couple of pages and that's it. It's really a, his life through the Civil War. Had he lived, you know, longer, you know, of course he died right after finishing, you know, maybe he would have done a third volume, but who knows. Um, but what we do here and the fact that the collection is open tells the story of who Grant was. Um, and we're able to do that because we get to see his interactions with his family members, with personal friends, with, with his superiors, um, and um, with the people who, uh, you know, his aides to camp and all of these types of folks, the people who are his close co confidants, and through those letters and through those memos and things like that and, and the personal materials, you know, uh, what emerges is a man who is um, uh, 
sure, he's, he's kind of quiet and introspective, but he's thoughtful, he's intelligent, he's creative, he's funny, he's extremely funny. Um, and um, he's a, a, a loving husband, a doting but stern father. Um, and he, like many, many men, is trying to live up to an image for his own father that he'll never quite measure up to, right? So he's just, a, he's a human being who's trying to impress his dad. All, I mean, even when he gets the third star, he writes to Julia, do you think father will finally be impressed with me now? I mean, he's a three-star general, for goodness sake, and he's worried about what his dad thinks about him. So what all of that means is he's a human being. And, and because he's a human being, he, is, he has the complexities that anyone would have. And like David said, you add in then the extraordinary times of uh, the buildup to secession, uh, no nothingism, uh, the war, and then reconstruction. And he is, becomes from just a, an individual living and working in a slave society to the man crushing the rebellion and leading this country to racial equality. I mean, I think if you even asked him in 1855, if he saw himself as president of the United States, he would have laughed you to the, to the Mississippi River, you know? But I do think, uh, just sort of uh, tagging onto what, what Ryan mentions there, I think this is something that makes Grant's story so compelling and that generations of Americans coming after him have, have sort of found something that resonates with the Grant story. Um, all of the things that Ryan's describing happen in roughly an eight to 10 year period in his life. Incredible trajectory. Um, you know, he goes from living in relative obscurity to actually sort of living out that American dream, right? That we tell our kids that any kid can grow up to become president of the United States. And that's what Grant does. Eddie, were you about to chime in on that as well? No, sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, well yeah, because I, I mean, I just think that's a, you know, a fascinating piece of the Grant story is that he is very much living kind of an ordinary life. And then he is thrust into extraordinary circumstances in, in U.S. history, um, you know, really unprecedented conflict. And through that, he really, along with others, kind of takes this perspective of if my job is to do something that is terrible and difficult and that involves a lot of difficulty and a lot of pain, then that's the job that I'm going to take on and I'm going to do that job and execute that responsibility in the way that I, I need to and that we have to do to prosecute the war and to bring this conflict to a conclusion. And so through that, he really is, is sort of vaulted into a sphere um, that he had no experience in, that he becomes very much a public figure. Um, and then in that, uh, he is approached about, well, what about the political realm? Because he has such tremendous success in the military sphere that then people are looking for, okay, who is the next great leader to bring us out of the war and conflict phase and into some type of national reunification and grappling with all of the consequences of what the war means. And so people look to Grant in the political realm, even though he is not particularly enthusiastic about it, um, but he sees it as a, yet again, another opportunity to serve his country. And, you know, then he pursues the sort of goals that come out of the Civil War, particularly African-American civil rights, and bringing the nation back together um, in, a, in a way that, that he looks at it and says, okay, this is how we have to tackle this. We have to kind of take this head on. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a fascinating journey to see him really as a as sort of an ordinary person grappling with these things in a very public venue and grappling with what does this mean now for the United States? How is the United States living out, um, you know, the founding documents and things like that uh, and putting that into practice in a post-war period? I, I honestly can't think of a president who faced a more daunting domestic agenda uh, than U.S. Grant, um, you know, realizing he's elected to the presidency in 1868. And so, well, David, I, I was just going to very quickly jump in and say, you know, I, I mean, you, 
I think you talked about the incredible trajectory of Grant going from, you know, kind of selling firewood in the streets of St. Louis before the war to uh, two-time president of the United States in roughly what, like eight years, you said. Um, you know, I think that gets to one of those myths that Grant was incompetent, that he was unintelligent, or that uh, he just simply, you know, bumbling his way through life, which is which is really not the case. If you, if you look at that trajectory, right, navigating politics, navigating the war, navigating uh, family life, and and all of this in a very difficult period of eight years, yet he has a, you know, meteoric rise where he goes from, again, selling, I, that's always what's so incredible to me, especially when we have to explain this to people, is that he's selling firewood in the streets of St. Louis, and eight years later, he's sitting in the White House, right, having won the Civil War, or in part, having a large part, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think with this meteoric rise, though, there is always, because this is the Civil War period, this question of race, right? Uh, when he's selling firewood on the streets of St. Louis, it's because he's failed as a farmer, because he is attempting to farm in a slave society alongside the enslaved, which number one, he actually, you know, he's out there in the field working with uh, the enslaved and the people he's hired and, and the people of St. Louis think that's utterly abhorrent. Um, he's participating in a slave society to make ends meet because he is married um, a, a young woman who is, uh, whose father is an enslaver. Grant's father is an abolitionist. He's not just a guy who thinks slavery is bad. He's actually an abolitionist and is appalled that he's married this, this Southern girl uh, in St. Louis. And Grant, you know, is trying to make ends meet. He's trying to make a family. So he moves to her family farm. They build a little house called Hard Scrabble. And he is gifted or purchases a man named William Jones. Um, in the meantime, he's participating actively in slave society by um, helping widow women, you know, uh, sell the enslaved people on their property after their husbands have passed away and all of these things. But then when 1859 comes along, he's, his farm is failing, his life is failing. He's, it's real gift of the Magi kind of thing, you know, where he's, he's selling firewood so he could buy a get Christmas presents and all of that. Um, and when he could possibly and probably would have, and anyone in St. Louis would have, sold William Jones to make money for his family, because he probably, I mean, $1,000 uh, in 1859 was a lot of money. He frees, he manumits William Jones and, and gives him his freedom. Um, and again, he's participating in a slave society, but there's there's a there's a sense of morality there that there's, and again, maybe it's this this thing about his father and, and always trying to get his father's attention. Uh, uh, um, but there's a sense of morality there that he has within him, even though he's in a slave society, that he frees this man, even though it would have benefited his family to have sold him and, and continue on in enslavement. Um, so then when, when the war happens, I mean, Grant's wife is coming along with him. She's in Holly Springs, Mississippi, when he's camped out in Oxford, Mississippi. And she brings two enslaved uh, individuals, uh, I think a woman and a, and a man, uh, uh, with her, uh, one of whom is named Jewel, uh, Julia, which is Grant's wife's name as well. Um, and, you know, it's a bad look for a Union general to have his wife come down to Mississippi with him with her slaves. Um, you know, theoretically, they are technically her father's slaves, but obviously they're, you know, they're taking care of Julia. And Grant understands the kind of hypocrisy and the way it looks bad in the media and all of that. And eventually, you know, they're, she or her, you know, it, basically with the Emancipation Proclamation, they're freed. Um, and then they don't return to St. Louis because who could blame them. They didn't want to go to St. Louis and Julia is hurt and doesn't understand. Um, but throughout this time though, Grant is in an area where there are tons of African-Americans who are slave and some who are free and he's living and working in this society. And then he's fighting a war in this society. And so when he comes to Mississippi, it's a war, uh, you know, tons of enslaved people are, are freeing themselves and coming to the union lines as refugees. And so then Grant is putting many of them to work. And then when the Emancipation Proclamation is issued, African-American men for the first time are allowed to serve in the United States Army. So then Grant has African-American soldiers in his army at this point. And Grant is a soldier. I mean, he went to West Point, he is a soldier, and he sees them 
doing the drudge work that they're doing, but then every once in a while they get involved in a fight and he sees them fighting and, and working hard and he sees them as soldiers. And so he, he actually starts to evolve as someone who is sort of ambivalent about slavery and enough that he participated in it um, to someone who starts to see black men as no different than any other man to the point that he thinks it's ridiculous that they don't get paid the same amount as any other soldier, right? Uh, they have to pay for their uniforms. They have to, um, you know, and so they not only make less money, but then they have to put money in for the uniforms that white soldiers and other things white soldiers don't have to do. And so eventually when he moves east to Virginia, he's fighting for their rights, equal rights as soldiers, um, fighting against the war department for, to make sure they have equal pay. And then eventually the war is over, African-American troops are garrisoning all across the South and Grant is, is um, you know, using these troops to keep the peace in the South in those early days of reconstruction before he was even president. Um, and then, he eventually becomes a whole hard supporter of equal rights, equal voting rights, and um, the you know the Fourteenth and Fifteenth Amendments. He wholeheartedly supports those. And and again, like David said, this is in a from manumitting William Jones to becoming president. It's uh, eight years or seven years. From manumitting William Jones to winning the war, it's only five years. Um, so it's a short amount of time, but he has an actual evolution in thought and in deeds and practice, right? So, and I think it's really interesting and really kind of um, a fascinating way to look at the man. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that we've, we already have a few questions that are coming in and, and I do wanna go ahead and I'll, 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 I'm gonna save some for them, but there are a couple that kind of fit where we are right now. Um, and one of those questions is, Really, how do you um, deal with Grant's relationship with his father-in-law and their opposing views about slavery, as well as the fact that Grant once owned a slave himself, and how is that shaping his policies about race once he is president? The father-in-law thing, um, well, I think Grant has a, an issue with, with father figures, <laughs> uh, whether they're his own father or his wife's father. Um, I mean, again, the, the whole thing about it is, it, you know, Grant, Grant is a slaveholder. Grant, you cannot deny the fact that Grant is actively participating in, in enslavement. He has enslaved a person. He is selling individuals on behalf of other people. He is doing that. Why, why is he doing this when he grew up with a father who believed in abolitionism? Because it wasn't, in all honesty, at that point in his life, wasn't important to him. More important to him was making a family for his wife, and he was doing that on his father-in-law's land. And he just wasn't considering anything beyond that, I think. Uh, you know. But then these things change. Again, the, the manumission of William Jones, can, I, I mean, in all honesty, should only be seen as an act of morality because any other, all the other choices are to keep William Jones enslaved. And it makes Grant's life easier and better if he keeps William Jones enslaved. But by giving him his freedom, I mean, this is the way the world was at the time is that he would have made money off of uh, selling him and made his own life better. But instead he made William Jones's life better by freeing him and Grant continued to struggle to the point that they had to move to Galena. Now, moving to Galena takes the slavery question out of it altogether, right? Because they're in Illinois. They're in northern Illinois. There are no enslaved in Illinois. Um, Julia's slaves, you know, they're Julia's slaves, even though her, her father enslaves them, um, stay in St. Louis, and he goes to work for his father and his brother in Galena. Um, so, you know, the, the relationship with the father-in-law is basically... He's trying to make a living and the only easy way to do it is to do it on his father-in-law's land who has given him free land, who has given him laborers and enslaved. And um, he's accepting of that society in order to try to make it work. When it doesn't work, then he moves back north to where his family is and moves out of an enslaved society. So when the war breaks out, he is no longer in a, an area where the, the enslavement is, you know, the norm, he's in a place where people are talking about abolition freely. Mm -hmm. So um, following up with that, um, and this is for 
for any of, of the three. I'm just going to start asking the questions. I'm really, really not going to address those to one individual. So just speak up when you feel comfortable. Um, how did Grant's experiences with the Black soldiers during the war affect his policies toward African Americans during the presidency of seeing them, them fighting? I mean, it had to have been a, a real impact there. I mean, I, I'll jump in a little bit on that. Uh, you know, it's it's really, you know, I think of sort of August 1863 is when he's writing to Lincoln. And this is, you know, at the conclusion of the Vicksburg campaign. And he's saying to President Lincoln, I really think that this is a great idea to arm the formerly enslaved and bring them into the ranks because and he says, I, I think they will make good fighters. I think they have proven themselves to be reliable uh, in, in terms of uh, army activity and support activity for the army up to this point, right? Which, which early in the war, there's all manner of skepticism as to whether that can even be uh, a viable option for the Union Army. And there's political opposition to it and cultural opposition and, and things like that. And so you see, um, you know, at that point in the war, Grant's perspective really sort of changing in that he's saying, um, you know, I think this is a good idea. I think we need to move forward with this because there's great potential there. And, and sort of going back to some of our earlier questions, if you don't mind, uh, Madam Moderator here, as, if, as I jump around a little bit, um, one of the things that I think is fascinating in the Grant story as he's relating to uh, African Americans in this era is that I, I think, and, and Ryan was was really, I think, did a good job of kind of uh, talking about this. I think Grant is very much an everyman figure in this particular time period, right? He grows up in an abolitionist household, but his own comment about his early life is that he says, I never felt strong inclinations toward abolitionism. It just wasn't something that took hold of his life. But everyone who commented on that period of his life when he was farming in Missouri talked about his discomfort with the slave system and with, uh, you know, enslaving people to work on his land. And so I think there's very much a sense that Grant represents a large majority of Americans and, and that perspective at that point, that there's a discomfort with slavery as a part of American society and the American economy. But most people are not falling into the camp of abolitionist or pro-slavery that there are a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the system, they don't particularly like it yet, what do they do? They actively participate in that system, right? Because slavery touches every aspect of American life to, to a certain degree, certainly economic life. Um, and, you know, Grant has the misfortune of entering into farming, something that he always wanted to do in a time that was absolutely terrible economically for small farmers. And so it's very tempting, I think, and, and you know, I think, I think Ryan's point is, is well taken that there's clearly, there has to be an ethical component to the decision that Grant comes to regarding William Jones and William Jones' freedom. But it's also complex in that it doesn't appear to be a necessarily a watershed moment where Grant makes this leap from being ambivalent at best and participating in the slave system uh, at worst, right, in a very direct way, he doesn't make this leap into suddenly becoming an abolitionist. Mm -hmm. That he continues to participate in aspects of the slave system. He continues to be kind of unsure about exactly how to deal with what he terms contrabands early in the war. Right, people who are enslaved who escape from the plantation and cross Union lines for protection, and there's this very gradual but not necessarily linear progression to then someone who gets into the highest office in the land and aggressively attacks the KKK. Um, right, and and so I do think there is a very real sense that the war years prove pivotal 
in that. And I really think that, um, and Ryan and I have talked about this before, we, you know, this, this is giving you a window into the uh, hallway conversations that we have at the Grant Presidential Library here, um, right, or, or conversations around the lunch table. There is this aspect that it seems that the incorporation of African American troops into the Union Army is, is really something that Grant sees as an important moment because I think he sees African-Americans in action, uh, fighting for their own freedom, fighting for their own rights. And, and that, right, he sees them wearing the uniform that he's wearing, and he has great respect for anyone who's wearing the Union uniform. And so I, I do think there is sort of a moment there, but uh, let, let me hit pause on, on my own monologue here and, and let others chime. Yeah, it's the it's the idea of the citizen soldier, right? And and Grant Grant I think is one of those people in the 19th century that believes in, you know, you've earned your citizenship through defense, through you know, through your military action, and and so when the war is over, it just seems logical to him that African American men um, deserve the right to vote. Now that now that African Americans are all freed, they are human beings living in the United States and should have a, a, a path to citizenship. And Congress gives them that path uh, through the Reconstruction Amendments and Grant supports that wholeheartedly. The other thing, you know, Grant is one of these guys where he can be ambivalent about something, but once he makes his mind up, he sticks with it and that's all he's gonna do. Uh, and when Grant joins the Republican party, he becomes a Republican. He was not a Republican before the war, voted for Democrats. He, in all honesty, was a little bit of a know nothing. He's always a little anti-Catholic and, and uh, in many ways, um, he finds these things superstitious and uncivilized and stuff. Um, but what he is, when he becomes a Republican though, he wholeheartedly latches onto the Republican uh, platform. And the Republican platform from the early days is free labor for free men, right? Well, these well African Americans now are free men, and they deserve free labor, and and laborers are the best citizens in the United States, right? Um, and then he also latches on to the notion of the the twin pillars of barbarism is what the Republican Party calls it. One pillar is slavery, the other is po uh, polygamy, right? And those are the twin pillars of barbarism. Well, the Republican Party and the U.S. Army has smashed and destroyed slavery for the most part, but there's there's still some slavery happening in the Western Hemisphere and in the United States. Um, and then, he, you know, at some point he focuses his eye during his presidency on polygamy and the Mormons, um, because that becomes a pet project of his, because it's in the Republican platform, right? And that's what you got to do. Um, but Grant, when the 15th Amendment is finally ratified and becomes law, Grant calls it the single greatest moment in American history since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And he's not wrong. The United States is, is fundamentally changed during this era, during his presidency. The United States is actually providing equal rights to individuals, at this point, African-American men only, um, something that would never even be considered or it was utterly unheard of just a couple of years prior. And Grant sees this for what it is, which is a watershed moment in the nation's history. And he's going to do what he has to do to protect that. Um, and there are a lot of, things that he tries, some of which are kind of boneheaded moves that embroil the United States in, into foreign policy, you know, failures and, uh, you know, that, that splits the Republican Party in half. But it doesn't change the fact that everything he's doing is on behalf of African-American equal rights and citizenship. And once he believes that, and we don't know the moment, he doesn't write that down, unfortunately. Today, I came to the conclusion, you know, um, but once he really believes that, he really believes that. Um, he has moments of doubt. There is a letter where he writes uh, late in his presidency where he says, maybe the 15th Amendment was a bad idea. But if you look at the moment that he's writing that, there is just more and more and more violence in the South. The Democrats have taken control of the Congress and won't give him the right to send more troops down into the South. They won't provide any funding for the Southern states. He's exhausted. He's tried everything he could. He thought he destroyed the Klan, which he did, but now all these other groups are coming up. And at some point in a moment of exhaustion, he writes a letter and says, maybe the 15th Amendment was a bad idea. Um, 
and then takes it back completely. And for the rest of his life, he's, he, he says nothing, but he believed in the whole uh, wholehearted support of equal rights for African-Americans. Um, but again, he's a human being and he had his moment of doubt, right? Um, I'm going to um, switch gears. <laughs> I'm going to switch gears here just a little bit. Um, you know, and, and, and part of, of this whole series is that we're looking at individuals who are just that. They're human beings, full of the complexities, full of, of, of evolution. Some evolve more than others. Some, you know, we, we still scratch our head and think, how can someone who was so enlightened in some ways be... Um, have some of those views. So, um, but I do, um, a, a couple of other um, um, areas that I do want to mention and get your um, thoughts on. And one is, um, you know, looking at Grant and his views toward Native Americans, because he's the first one to appoint a Native American to a major federal position. Um, of course, that um, Native American would not have been a U.S. citizen, um, but what it, it's it's very interesting to me because once again you have that mixed um, view of like on the one hand he seems so progressive, but on the other hand, oh wait a second, what did you have to seem white to be able to get his approval, and thus that's why that Native American um, Brigadier General Parker was was appointed. Anyone want to take that one on? I mean, I can, unless David, you want to chime in? Okay. You go ahead and I'll chime in in a moment here. Gotcha. So yes, um, Grant's relationship with Native Americans is extremely complicated. Um, when he becomes president of the United States, you're right, he nominates um, General Parker to become the uh, commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. First Native American to ever be in any position that high in the federal government. Parker had been a, a government bureaucrat prior to the American Civil War, and he had worked in the government, but he never would have had any chance at a position that high as commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Parker was a, a, a chief of the Seneca tribe in New York. And you're right, there were many who questioned whether he was even a citizen and could hold such a position. Uh, this is where Grant and his attorney general start doing some, some um, fancy lawyer work. And they come to the conclusion that the 14th Amendment says citizenship is bestowed to all persons in the United States, except for Native Americans not taxed. That's in the 14th Amendment. And Grant says to Parker, do you pay taxes? And he said, I pay taxes in the state of New York all the time. Grant says, okay, then you're a citizen of the United States. You have paid taxes in the United States. And nobody in the United States Congress is going to fight that and they approve him. Um, Parker was on his staff at Appomattox, right? He's known Parker since the war. Parker is a well-respected individual in the US government. And so the fact that he was a Native American in Grant's eyes is that much the better. Um, Parker is also a very westernized Native American. Um, he, you know, he wears the uniform of the US Army. He is a Christian. He's all of these things. And in Grant's inaugural address, he says, I mean, it's one of the few times that someone speaks about Native Americans in an inaugural address um, in any way, in any way of, that is, you know, a good way. And Grant says the treatment of Native Americans has been horrible. He goes, we need to do what we can to, to give them a path to citizenship. But in that path to citizenship, they must be um, civilized and Christianized. And another C word that I can't remember. Um, and... Um, that is the basis of his Native American policy. Native Americans deserve to be equal citizenships, just like white Americans and African Americans, equal citizens. But they have to get rid of their old culture. They have to get rid of their old hierarchies. They have to be educated and they have to do free labor. They need to stop hunting and gathering, whichever tribes might do that. They have to build schools and learn Western rules and they have to become Christians. But if you do all of that, you get to be citizens of the United States. And it's about this time Congress also takes away Native Americans uh, legally in the U.S., takes away their rights as foreign nations. So now during the Grant administration, we're no longer, the United States is no longer dealing with Native Americans as foreign governments with it, you know, to do treaties with. 
they're wards of the state, right? And so that's when they start creating more and more reservations and they're moving people from the plains to, you know, uh, from you know, the Dakotas to the plains. And all of the things that they're saying to them are, you need to build schools, you need to start a farm, you need to learn how to farm, and you need to go to church. And when you do all of those things, plus you wear Western clothing, we will then agree that you're a good American and you can become citizens. And there are many who agree and attempt to do this. And Congress, and they even established a constitution in Oklahoma to create a state that is wholly run by Native Americans. And Congress, and Grant approves it, and Parker approves it, and Congress votes it down. Um, and so, and this is a Congress that at this point is still supposedly a Republican Congress, and they vote it down. And things get complicated once Parker resigns, and there's a lot of reasons why he resigned. Um, and once Parker resigns, the Native, the Bureau of Indian Affairs falls into the hands and Grant gives it to religious groups, um, thinking they'll be more moral than the politicians who used to be in the Bureau of Indian Affairs and were stealing all the money. Um, and then everything is extremely complicated when gold is found in the Dakotas and all of the treaties with the, um, with the Lakota Indians are thrown to the side and um, white settlers flood in there and war breaks out. And what essentially is the new, uh, new war of the reconstruction um, occurs and many, many, many Native Americans are killed. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I have um, a few, Monica, oh, I'm sorry, David, go ahead, oh, yeah. please do. I, I was just gonna jump in uh, because, uh, you know, um, I think there's a, there's a very interesting aspect that kind of ties together uh, some of what we've talked about with Grant's relationship to Black Americans and Grant's relationship to Native Americans, right? When we think of the Native American um, sort of situation during Grant's presidency, there are people constantly in Grant's ear arguing in favor of a military solution, right? Because ev everyone uh, in that era views the U.S. government and U.S. society interacting with Native Americans as a problem. That is the sort of the default setting for everyone. Some people are arguing that the solution to the problem is a war of extermination. And Grant very consistently argues against his former colleagues in the military and says a military solution is not a viable option. It is, it is not a moral option. Uh, it, it carries with it no benefit for us ultimately. And he makes this argument over and over again. But at the same token, as, as Ryan pointed out, the offer of citizenship is never without sort of strings attached, um, right? Grant talks about the terrible treatment of Native Americans in the history of the United States in that first inaugural. And he talks about the need for the benign influence of education and civilization. And so it very much comes back to this idea for him of, are you willing to adopt essentially white ways and enter white society, right? Parker is an example of someone, like Ryan was saying, who, who took that on and Grant had no problem sort of interacting with him, right? So if, if we sort of flip this around and say, okay, so what's going on here? If Grant had been presented with an idea of extending citizenship to people living in traditional societies in sub-Saharan Africa in the 1870s, he would have scoffed at the idea that they would have, that they could be citizens of the United States, not on a racial basis, but on this sort of cultural and ethnic idea of civilization. And so what, what I think is, is really sort of telling in this that, that gives us perspectives on both Grant's interactions with African-Americans and Native Americans is that in a moment when so many people for so many years have been arguing for a, I guess, essentially a, a racial essentialist perspective, right? People were constantly arguing that African-Americans could not handle citizenship by virtue of the essential, supposedly essential qualities of their race. Grant was, was never seems to be in that boat. And so it's, it's never a question for him, it seems, of 
the essential qualities of a given race, but rather the willingness of people from a different race or a different ethnic background to relinquish traditional ways of living and adopt white Western ways of living. And so I, I, to me, that, that seems to be a, a lens that, that sort of sheds a lot of light on what he was thinking in relating to different groups. And so I just wanted to, to throw that one out there. Yeah, there's a, there's a great Thomas Nass cartoon. Well, great, but there's a, an interesting Thomas Nass cartoon and it, you know, it's titled Robinson Crusoe Makes a Man of His Friday. And it shows Grant um, dressing an African-American, uh, excuse me, a Native American man in a suit. And in the pockets of the suit are two pieces of paper. One says taxes and the other says vote, right? So he's making him a citizen. And in the background on, on a shelf put away to no longer be used is a bow and arrow, a tomahawk, a bottle of fire water, right? Um, and underneath it, it says, by the sweat of thy brow, thou shalt earn thy bread. And underneath that is a hoe and a rake and, um, you know, a, a copy of Harper's Weekly, because if you're a real civilized person, you read Harper's Weekly, and a book of ABCs. And essentially, it's, that's it in a nutshell. Grant says, you put away your old culture. That was great for thousands of years, but, it, but I want you to be citizens of the United States. You should be citizens of the United States. To do that, you need to accept Western civilization uh, intellectually and agriculturally and culturally and all of these things. And, you know, but he says, and then you get to become citizens and you get to create states. Instead of being the, the Seneca nation, you're now the state of Seneca. And again, it's this weirdly progressive idea that is also um, utterly devoid of, of, of understanding the, you know, the racial implications of, of Western civilization at that time. It's just, this is what one does when one is a citizen. African Americans are civilized. Native Americans can be civilized. To grant, Mormons are not civilized. Southern, Southern secessionists are not civilized. And if they continue to create violence in the South, they are uncivilized barbarians who don't belong as citizens of this country. So he has a notion of what makes one a civilized person, but then a civilized person gets to be a citizen. It's not based on race. It's about how you comport yourself, the rules that you follow and all of this. And um, like when he travels the world, he thinks the Japanese are wonderfully civilized and wonderful. And he's a little put off by China uh, because they still hold on to their cultural norms. But the Japanese who he meets, the, the emperors and stuff, well, they're all wearing Western uniforms with lots of ribbons and things. And, you know, that's what he thinks of as a civilized individual. So. Is there, a, is there maybe a terrible irony that we've just been talking about how Grant struggled mightily with farming himself, and yet farming becomes part of uh, the, the sort of uh, requirement for Native Americans entering citizenship? I, I, I just think it's a little bit uh, sort of funny to me in thinking about that. Well, his other I'm idea gonna, is if you can't farm, be a soldier, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to switch gears yet again because um, we have a few questions. I want to make sure we get to as many as we possibly can. One, I do want someone to speak a little bit to, um, well, it's once again that evolution of, of Grant as an individual um, in looking at General Orders number 11 during the Civil War. And that's implication toward the the um, Jewish people, and um, and then how he does ask for forgiveness later as president. And actually, um, I believe it was in um, the Philadelphia Jewish Record when he passed away in 1885. Um, they stated, "None will mourn his loss more sincerely than the Hebrew." But if you wouldn't mind just telling us very briefly about General Order Number Eleven how that impacted um, the, the Jewish um, folks that were in that area, um, and, and what was Abraham uh, Lincoln's response to that? Well, yeah, I, I can jump in and kind of start the conversation here with that. Um, you know, the particular moment in December, 1862, uh, Grant is dealing with a lot of his least favorite uh, aspects of being a military commander, and that's dealing with 
commercial life, you know, commerce and the sale of cotton and who can be, uh, you know, permitted to transport and sell cotton and dealing with all of these things that he sees negatively impacting the war effort, right? He's very, very single-minded in the military objectives aspect of it and doesn't want to be dealing with all of these questions. So of course, enter into this, as, as uh, we've mentioned earlier, uh, the turbulent relationship with his father. Uh, his father uh, always uh, was trying to look for an angle uh, that he could somehow use for his own uh, benefit and, and uh, especially in terms of commerce. And so he is partnering with different merchants to try to utilize his son's position to help them find some channels to be able to make things happen and make some money, uh, right? In, in the fine American tradition of wartime profiteering, right? And so uh, Grant, in the midst of this is dealing with all of these questions and here comes his father within partnership with some merchants who are actually Jewish. And so we think that this is informing some of his perspective when this happens, when he issues General Orders Number 11, as it has come down in history to be known, uh, where he expels all those who are Jewish from the Department of the Tennessee, or excuse me, the, the Mississippi, uh, actually, I believe. Um, and so, right, so he, it's sort of that uh, classic uh, problem of scapegoating, where there's a problem and rather than directly addressing the problem, he's lashing out at a vulnerable group of people, right? Terrible repercussions for individuals and families living in that geographic area that Grant is overseeing at that point, um, right? People are, are uprooted from their homes and cast out before the order can be rescinded. Um, from Abraham Lincoln's perspective, it's a terrible political disaster because of the high number of Jewish Americans who are supportive of the Union war effort and directly engaged in the Union war effort. And so you see, right, that immediately Grant gets to deal with the fallout of this ill-conceived, ill-timed, anti-Semitic order that he issues. And then like you mentioned, he's, but I think this is a, another sort of great piece of the Grant story, the very human story, is that rather than digging in, rather than doubling down on this, he ends up sort of trying to dig his way out of this and make amends over the course of his life. Uh, you look at some of the apologies he sort of issued or, or wrote to individuals, and they seem kind of half-hearted at first, Right, that he's kind of trying to dodge responsibility, it seems, and saying, well, yeah, somebody may have issued that in my office and I didn't really, it's like, come on, come on, you, you know this is you lashing out in that moment. But then he really does end up spending time with Jewish Americans and engaging with them and appointing Jewish Americans to important positions in the United States, visiting a synagogue, um, right, uh, I believe he's the one of the first American presidents to to do that, and so um, yeah, it, it's it's just again another very human story of seeing someone fail, but then seeing someone recognize that failure and come back around and say, "What do I need to do to make this right?" And so, and just to to plug people who are better at it than us. Uh, Jonathan Sarna has a really good book called When Grant Expelled the Jews, where he goes into really good detail um, about everything surrounding the issuing of the order, the aftermath of the order, and then looking into the presidency, what is Grant doing to um, make amends for what Julia called that damned order? Uh, and, you know, and, you know, all these things from sending aid to, to Jewish um, refugees in Eastern Europe on at the, you know, during the Russo Turkish, one of the many Russo Turkish wars. Um, and, you know, all of these things that David talked about, it, you know, it shows, you know, again, it kind of hems and haws at the moment, but 
as it goes along. And, and it also shows that he's a politician, right? I think sometimes we like to say, well, Grant wasn't really a politician. He was a politician. He understood the politics about, of everything. He understood he needed to make, not just pretend to make amends with the Jewish community. He needed to make actual amends to the Jewish community because A, it was good for him to do so, but B, it was politically important for him to do so. Um, and, you know, it's like when we talk about African, the African-American vote, Grant really wants African-Americans to vote, A, because he believes they have equal rights, they should have equal rights, and B, because he knows they're going to vote Republican, and they're going to vote for him, and they're going to vote Republican legislatures, they're going to make up Republican legislatures in the South, and they're going to pass local laws that are going to then work in tandem with the laws that he's trying to get passed at the national level. And it's going to keep the Republican Party in power. So all of these things are political in nature, but it doesn't change the fact that he still has some sort of moral awakening or at least understanding of, in particular, General Orders Number 11, what a mistake that was. And I need to apologize for that and do better about that. Um, and if it helps me politically, then that's even better, right? Um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, and then my fun fact is, it's actually General Orders number 12. It was misnumbered, and uh, history has decided to, what to call it, but it's we have a copy of the original on display here in the museum, and it's got a 12 on it. So. Another good reason to come actually visit the museum. So, um, switching gears, um, we have a question. Is it fair to compare Grant and Lincoln in the sense that both were in many ways considered um, unimportant or in crucial ways unqualified, but both when challenged showed they were exactly the person needed to do what the nation needed done at that time. Well, I would, I would argue Lincoln's qualifications as a politician were already there. He had served in the United States Congress. He was a, a pretty vocal uh, Republican in Illinois. Prior to being a Republican, he was a vocal member of the Illinois State Senate. I think I think Lincoln's political bona fides are pretty legitimate uh, versus Grant's where he's political in the sense that he knows politics exists and he participates in politics, but he's not a politician. Um, so I would say that Lincoln's Lincoln's political trajectory is one that is carefully cultivated by Lincoln. Uh, versus Grant, who he is that uh, the march of history thrust him into uh, these things. But the fact that they both come from extremely humble beginnings um, and, and make their way to the same house uh, and the same position, I think is an extraordinary thing when you consider that, you know, their, their presidencies are only a few years apart. Um, but I think Lincoln's cultivation as a politician starts early in the 1840s. And at this point, Grant's just a young officer fighting in a war that he thinks is ridiculous in Mexico. And, um, you know, so, so my argument would be that, that I, I, would, I would argue that Grant's rise to the White House is a little more shocking than Lincoln's. I think Lincoln, Lincoln maybe didn't want to necessarily become president. And after Cooper Union, he's kind of thrust onto the stage. But he certainly wanted to be involved with and have a say in national politics. Grant didn't until he had to, or, or didn't until you know it was kind of put before him. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, question. Another question: How did President Grant view the role of federal troops stationed in the South post Civil War? Was it to safeguard the newly freed slaves, promote opportunities through the Freedmen's Bureau, or is it to ensure that succession efforts would not succeed if there were any future ones? There's a great book by Andy Lang <laughs> called In the Wake of War that uh, I suggest you all read. It won big awards. Uh, what was the last name again, Ryan? I'm sorry, Eddie, what? Andy, Andrew Lang, L-A-N-G, Lang. Okay. just happens to be a professor here at Mississippi State, but, uh, you know, but ask Civil War historians, they all think it's a great book and it won lots of awards. And he talks about the use of, of garrison troops, which are African-American troops in the South. And, and he, he shows two things. One, the majority of the troops in the South following the war are, are African-American troops. And two, there are very few troops in the South. Uh, in, 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 during the Reconstruction era, they are sent. You know, infantry, you know, regiments and stuff are sent where there are pockets of violence, and then they leave again. 
the garrison troops are the ones staying in those port towns. Um, I think there's something and there's something to it in Grant's mind for those to be African American troops because they're kind of in charge of things. And many of them were enslaved on, you know, by people in those towns. And I think there is a, um, there's definitely a political message he's sending to the people of the South. Um, and yes, it is to protect the rights of the freedmen and to keep Southern violence and Southern, um, you know, kind of secessionist ways in check. I think it's all of that. Um, but I think the, that book will show you though, because he really looks at the statistics and the numbers that this, and this is part of that lost cause narrative you were talking about at the beginning. This notion that the South is under the, you know, the brutal yoke of Republic, of Union Army and, you know, their neck, you know, the boots on the neck and all of this, it's just not there. There's not enough. I mean, there are millions of Southerners and there are a few thousand troops, <laughs> right? And there are just whole swaths of the South that never see a Union soldier again after the war is over, you know? Um, but in the capital cities, in the port cities, sure, there's a significant military presence there. Um, and the fact that they're generally speaking African-American troops is a political statement by the army and Grant is in charge of the army, so. Right. And Ryan, don't you think that uh, some of that relates to, to the sensitivity of Grant during his presidency of the charge, to the charges of Caesarism, right? That, that he's very conscious of and trying to avoid the appearance of being the military man who then becomes the political strong man. And it, in some ways, I, I think it, it hamstrings him in some of his efforts to safeguard African-American civil rights in particular in the South, because he doesn't want to cultivate that perception that he's just going to send you know, massive amounts of federal troops in. Do you, I mean, do you think that's fair? I do. Yeah, I do. Um, look, and there's still there's still a racial aspect to, you know, he, he wants black troops to be seen in southern cities. But there's a real legitimate question when it comes to the big grand review. Right. Um, uh, they do a big grand review that lasts a couple of days where all these soldiers come through and there's not a black soldier to be seen in Washington, D.C. in that parade. And you could say, well, because they're all in Garris, they're all being garrisoned uh, in the south. Richmond's not that far away and the trains are running, right? So he could have easily had troops of African-American troops in the Grand Review and they're nowhere to be seen. They're working, um, but a regiment or two could have easily been pulled up there. And so some of that is also, um, you know, him playing politics with those types of things as well. And he deserves to be, you know, chided for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a couple more questions. We had a few that people had um, asked us when they were registering, and then we have one that's still open from um, um, a presenter here. And then I do want to end with um, chatting with Eddie a little bit about bicentennial um, activities and things that are going on. But before we get there, um, a question on how did the grants treat the staff in the White House when they lived there? You know, it's interesting knowing Grant's background and how he was raised, looking at his wife, who was uh, raised in a home that used enslaved labor. So that's a that's a really interesting question. How is there is there any um, documentation or or anything that would talk to how they were treated? I I actually that. That's a good question that I've never thought of and never thought to look into. Um, you know, one thing he does, you know, I, I know nothing about like, you know, the, the servants or, or, you know, the people who serve and cook and all of that. I can only assume that many of them were African-American, but I'm not 100 percent sure on that. I know when Lincoln had when it comes to his private staff, Lincoln had young men, you know, who worked as clerks, Hay and um, Nicolay being the most famous. Um, Grant, on the other hand, makes his staff entirely out of soldiers. Um, many of whom happen to just be guys that were his aides to camp during the war. One of them happens to be his brother-in-law, you know. Uh, he, this is when Grant starts really doling out jobs to friends. Um, and there's a lot of people who, who, are, who are not happy with that. Um, they don't like the idea of the president, this, you know, this civilian having a military staff. Um, and there are problems that occur from that. 
uh, I got to be honest, I don't really know anything. Like, I don't know who took over his horses and how he, he, the relationship he had. Can you talk a little bit, David, maybe about, I know that there were some, some staff members or servants or whatever phrase you want to use uh, in his final days when he was writing the memoirs. Do you know a little bit about them? That might tell us something. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. I don't know much specifically about uh, White House staff, but um, thinking about sort of the way Ulysses and Julia related to other people working for them at, at different times in their lives, um, just, you know, kind of uh, briefly, uh, Harrison Terrell was an African-American man who sort of served as, as kind of a valet to Grant, especially at the end of his life. And there, there's, there's some interesting stories about his work with Grant um, and just sort of the, res the mutual respect that existed between the two men, you know, even as Grant is dying um, there and, and suffering greatly, just, just the way they interacted um, that, that's kind of fascinating. But then also uh, you read certain sections of Julia Grant's memoirs uh, and you really get uh, pieces of, of sort of a, a narrative that sounds like someone who is pretending to be Southern aristocracy in the antebellum period. And so um, she talks you know, glowingly about all the little children that she grew up with who she fails to mention were enslaved people and paints this very rosy picture of how wonderful life was. And yet, you know, when you go to uh, the White Haven site there in St. Louis, where, uh, you know, Julia's family home, I think they do a great job of telling some of the stories of the enslaved people there and how as soon as it was feasible, the enslaved people removed themselves from the premises and did not come back. And so uh, I, I think that Julia had an idealized view of how she related to people who were, who were charged with serving her at different stages in her life. And I think Grant may have had a, a different interaction with people who were, uh, who were tasked with helping him, at, especially at late stages in his life. So that may tell us something about, about how they may have related to White House staff at that point. That's great. That's great. I know that was a, that's really a great question. And it, it's, yeah. you know, it's one that um, very interesting. Harrison Terrell's son becomes a judge, uh, Robert Terrell. He marries a woman named Mary Church Terrell, who is a, a leading um, suffragette uh, as well. And they're kind of the toast of uh, the African-American society in Washington, D.C. for many years. Um, she is a does she's fascinating. I mean, he they're both fascinating, but she is fascinating for sure. Okay, thank you. So one more question before we um, um, finish by talking a little bit about bicentennial activities. Another question that came in um, that someone had asked about earlier, and it's a perfect segue for next month. And that is, did Grant play any role in the compromise between Hayes and um, Tilden? during the disputed election of 1876. And as you know, uh, we'll be talking about Hayes at length next month. So I guess setting the stage for that uh, in that very complicated election. I mean, I, I'll just chime in. Uh, I think one thing that's fascinating to see in that story of, of Grant's uh, sort of involvement there. Again, I think this speaks to Ryan's point that we tend to dismiss Grant as a politician. And yet at every stage in that whole process, you see Grant in a very savvy way, forcing different sides to come together and come to a legal process that people have to work through and compromise and reach some sort of agreement there. And so there's, there's a lot of uh, very shrewd negotiating and uh, sort of uh, backroom politics, 19th century politics there that, that I think speak to Grant's understanding of the situation. And I also think it, it sort of uh, speaks to the tragedy of what ends up happening and that Grant is trying to safeguard 
trying to find some way to, to carry forward the reforms and the progress that takes place in, during Reconstruction, especially in terms of African-American civil rights. And knowing what we know now, ultimately, it doesn't end up having the effect that, that he had hoped or that traction is not maintained there. Um, but yeah, uh, kind of a, an amazing story there that, that I, I think really speaks to Grant and his respect for constitutional processes. Um, so yeah, he, he has a lot of conversations um, with the Secretary of State Hamilton Fish about the, the situation. Um, while he's not actively involved in it, he has a lot of opinions on you know which state electors do and do not. And if Tilden, Tilden has the majority of votes, but there's parishes in Louisiana and there's counties in South Carolina, and some of these aren't working. And you know, it has to be legal electors. And, and so he's trying to find the nuance in there for Hayes to win. Um, I would say that the biggest thing he did when Hay, right after Hayes is declared the winner, and this is really close to the inauguration, and back then inaugurations were in March. Um, Hayes comes to town and he stays at the White House and they're having dinner and it's the day before the inauguration and Grant brings the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court over. They excuse themselves from the dining room and go into the room next door and he, he has Hayes sworn in as president in the White House. Um, this is part and parcel because he wanted to make sure that it happened and it was going to be Monday before the inauguration because you can't have them on Sunday. And also he was concerned about what might occur in the next 24 hours, um, particularly from um, uh, Southern Democrats who, you know, weren't happy about this, this agreement or, you know, if the agreement actually existed, uh, but the decision. And um, so he has him sworn in. So the inauguration occurred in, you know, the, the cigar room or was the blue room, I guess, in the blue room of the White House you know, 48 hours before they did it on the uh, Capitol lawn. So that's kind of Grant knowing that, look, we have to have someone in place. Let's inaugurate him now. And it's also Grant saying, now I can finally leave uh, and go on my <laughs> world tour. So uh, we'll start packing up and we'll be gone by Monday. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I mean, a little sneaky. Um, obviously, there are inaugurations that occur in all sorts of places on planes and things um, after assassinations and things. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the first non official inauguration, even though it was official. Sure, sure. Well, that's great. I am going to now ask Eddie if he wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about the bicentennial activities, things that are happening. It's the 200th anniversary of Grant's birth. And I know kickoff started, I guess it was last weekend, right? Um, and um, if you would just share a little bit about that would be wonderful. Sure. So um, the Grant Association was appointed in um, 2015, I believe, by the U.S. Senate as a lead organization to spearhead Grant's uh, 200th birthday. And so obviously, I, th I think we had bigger plans uh, before the pandemic to, to really make this a, a huge year nationally. But We've had to we've had to pull back on some of those, not just the grant library, but other grant sites around the country. Uh, but yeah, just last week, uh, March third through fifth, the Grant Association held its annual meeting, and it also served as the official kickoff for the bicentennial. Uh, March fourth being a significant day, as Ryan said, because that's when Grant was inaugurated, and and so um, we hosted the president of the White House Historical Association, Stuart McLaurin. And he was one of our um, one of the, the folks that helped us kick off the event. And then we also had a panel of scholars where they discussed Grant at 200 and certainly Grant's legacy and mythology and all of that. Um, we had Dr. Joan Wall from UCLA, Dr. Ann Marshall, our, uh, our new executive director here at the Grant Presidential Library, Dr. John F. Marzalak, our former executive director, Dr. Edna Green Medford from Howard, and Dr. Kaylin Jenny from um, from University of Virginia, the John L. Now Center, uh, who, who discussed Grant. And then um, Dr. Andy Lang, who's uh, in the wake of war, whose uh, book Ryan plugged a little bit ago, uh, was the keynote speaker for the, uh, the Grant Association's big dinner. So we, we kind of kicked off the, the bicentennial and then there'll be, there'll be various other events uh, throughout the country. The 27th will be the birthday celebration in New York.
at the tomb ceremony, West Point will be involved with that. The Grant Monument Association is, is spearheading that. There are also events at the Boyhood Home, which I believe is in Brown County, maybe um, in Ohio, and then in the uh, at the birthplace, which is in Claremont County, I believe in Ohio as well. They're going to have events, and then Mississippi State will also uh, the Grant Library and Mississippi State will have a traveling exhibit that will make the rounds in all these grant sites throughout the throughout the year. Um, and that was put together by by um, here in MSU Libraries by Sarah McCullough. And, and various other staff members like Ryan and, and David. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we had bigger hopes for the bicentennial year, but we're making the best of it. And certainly to um, you know, help raise awareness, not only about the various organizations that are helping put this together, but about Grant himself as well. Great, Eddie, thank you so much. And we do have links to everything. I know we um, individuals can go directly to um, the Grant Presidential Library website, but we also have links through our presidentsandrace.org website as well that will link you there directly. So um, I think that'll link to the, some of the, the symposia and things we had, correct? Yes, yes, yes that's exactly right. Great. Well, Ryan, David, Eddie, I just want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think we could have talked for a whole lot, a whole lot longer, and I appreciate you um, staying with me a little bit longer as we we went over about fifteen minutes. Um, I um, just uh, it was very um, interesting, and there's so much about him. Um, so I thank also our viewers. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone next month when we continue our series, and we'll be addressing Rutherford B. Hayes. That is Thursday, April 14th, also 7 o'clock Eastern, 6 p.m. Central. Um, you can go to presidentsandrace.org to register for that as well. Another reminder that we do, usually within 24 hours, send out a survey um, on the program. If you would please take time to fill out that survey that really helps us as we prepare and plan for future events. So on behalf of all of us at the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.